The way to think differently is to act differently and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast, where host Barry O'Reilly seeks to synthesize the superpowers of extraordinary individuals into actionable strategies you can use to think big, start small, and learn fast, and find your edge with excellence. Here's your host, Barry O'Reilly. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast. On this show, I'm delighted to be joined by Tendai Vicky. Tendai is an associate partner at Strategizer, where he helps companies innovate for the future while managing their core businesses. He's a prolific author of three books, the most recent of which, Pirates in the Navy, is a manifesto, How to Drive Corporate Innovation in Large Organizations. He's a regular contributor to Ford's and also regularly recognized in the Thinkers 50 for many of his methods and models about emergent management techniques and tools. On this show, Tendai shares lots of his stories and examples about where he's helped organizations drive corporate innovation and succeed where many have failed. What are the mistakes are made? How do you get past them? How do you build a system to scale innovation in your organization? But before we get started, it's interesting to know the way Tendai found his way there. While he's a doctorate, it wasn't necessarily starting in corporate innovation. In many ways, he started somewhere very different. I was an academic for a long time. And in fact, I thought I was what I was going to do. I was going to be a professor at university, publish loads of papers, engage in loads of pointless debates about minutia of human thinking. <laughs> you know, people always say that academics argue so much because the stakes are so low. But <laughs> so I was going to spend a lot of time doing that. And the turning point for me, so there are two things that were happening at the same time. One, I got married and then I had three children. And when you're married... All not at the same time, though, right? Like Exactly, yeah. Yeah, It happened all simultaneously in an instant. (laughs) Like rent a mob. The money just doesn't work. Like the finances just don't make any sense. Like, I mean, luckily they were all boys, so they could wear hand-me-downs. Like, So so that was all right. But I'm one um, of six kids, so my whole life was built around whoever was the oldest got it new, and then it just worked its way through the family. Man, by the time it gets to the sixth person, that's, that's a long it's way. It's about holding together. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that was like an emotional struggle that was in me already. And I was constantly looking for opportunities to make extra money. So I'd volunteer to do some training. We're not volunteer, but, you know, like do some training, get paid maybe 300 bucks or 600 bucks just to do some extra training, workshopping yeah. stuff, using the psychology in different businesses. And then I got, while I was doing the psychology thing, I got a fellowship to go to Stanford. Wow. And I was in 2009 to do like a research program there. But as life works out, when I got to Stanford, the person I was working with, I was supposed to be working with, they were in some transition in their life or something like that. I don't know exactly what happened, but they basically left me on my own there. So I wasn't really... being a bit tough. No, it was okay, actually. It was okay in the sense that I was on full salary and at a loose end. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. (laughs) So the people that ended up like, because I'm in Silicon Valley, the people that ended up taking me under their wing were startup people. Right. And so I literally ended up spending all my days in Steve Blank's classes. And mind you, before this, I'd never met him. Yeah. I'd never even heard of him. (laughs) Right. That's super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because I was in the psychology field. I'd never heard of Steve Blank. I'd never heard of Eric. I'd never heard of anything. So rather than spend time in the school of psychology, I ended up spending time in the graduate school of business and in the D school where they were doing all the design thinking stuff. And I was just hanging out there and like absorbing that area. And that was the turning point. That was when I, I was like, man, this is far more interesting than what I spend my time doing. But I don't have any expertise in this. How do I even get involved? And that was basically the emotional moment. Yeah, it's really interesting, right? Because we jump forward like 10, 15 years now you know, so much of our product development skills is about pairing humans to a certain extent with these technology. And some of the, I imagine like you've got these business leaders talking about entrepreneurism, building products, but so much of it is grounded in the human side. Okay. You know, so I'm curious now, as, as probably unintentionally, you know, it sounds like you had obviously this deep knowledge of PhD in the human side. And now you're starting to sort of immerse yourself in the technology business entrepreneur side. How have bringing all that convergence together, like what were the patterns you saw that were 
sort of similar? What did you see that was different? What were some of the things that struck you as you were sitting in those classes, maybe? Yeah, so the first hook that made a lot of sense to me was because my expertise when I was teaching psychology is I used to teach research methods and statistics. So how do you run experiments on humans? I was even the chair of the ethics committee in the School of Psychology at the University of Kent. So people would send me their research proposals and then I'd approve them for ethics or make comments about how they can get informed consent and all these things. So the research element of it for me was like something that was very clear to me as a major expertise of mine. And so as we stepped into the lean startup movement, the testing with human beings, learning about people's needs, diving deep into their psychology, really going, and you know, like when Rob Fitzpatrick published the mom test, I was like, yeah, that's it. In psychology, we call it getting rid of confounding variables. He calls it the mom test. It's even a better way to describe it. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And so that was my first entry into it. So if you see my first blog posts, actually, they're really about experimentation and methodology. In fact, I was such a geek that my first post was criticizing the fact that entrepreneurs called what they did experiments. Oh, this is like, good, right? Yeah, that's what I like. So give us some cliff notes. Like, what are the sort of key arguments there? Because like, It's not an experiment because in the social sciences and in science in general, an experiment is a pretty exclusive royal term used for a specific type of testing. It's like the gold standard of research yep. running an experiment because you need two things you need the ability to measure a dependent variable and you also need to be the one in charge of manipulating the independent variable so you need to actually be the one who sets it at 10 and then sets it at 15 and then you see the effect on the thing that you're measuring and you've controlled all other extraneous influences on the connection between these two things you're measuring and then we call that an experiment everything else Beyond besides that is either discovery thing or an interview thing. or But now we call them experiments and then we say your experiment is an interview. So for me, that was just like, that's weird. That's like bad use of language. <laughs> right, right. It's so great to actually hear that. But like a lot of things in our industry, right, like the language becomes, it brings people together, right? Mm. And mm. I think when you're talking about pure science here and someone like yourself who's done a PhD has to obviously defend PhDs, like I know the notions mean very specific things to different exactly. people, right? Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, experiment sounds cool, right? Like who isn't experimenting now? Everywhere you go, people are entrepreneurs are amazing experimenters. But the reality is, is there true rigor there? Mm-hmm. Uh, for many people, probably not, right? Exactly. But it sounds sort of cool, hip, and who doesn't want to feel like they're a scientist because they're sort of working through yeah. this. But I think, again, this obviously goes back a little bit to your notions around social sciences as well. Like, so we're not in control of so many of the variables when we're building products, when we're trying to introduce sort of new techniques into organizations. So maybe tell me a time for yourself then. So as you sort of rolled forward and you started to, you obviously finished your time at Stanford and started to bring these two worlds together and coach people how to do this. What were some of those sort of on learning moments for you as you started to bring this into organizations or maybe some realizations you had about yourself as you were sort of starting to tackle this? Yeah, so I mean, there was a couple of unlearning moments. So the first one was I thought that I needed to do an MBA to get good at this. So I, I took the two years out and I did an MBA <laughs> just so nice. I could learn business. So cool. when I came back to the UK, I did an MBA. And I don't use much of the stuff these days, but it was an interesting transition into business. I think the bigger one for me is I've always loved writing. Like writing has always been a thing that I've... I've yeah, you're great at it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you're you. like, you produce stuff, you're on Forbes, you know, a high velocity writer. It's very, yeah. very impressive. Yes. Basically, that's the way to describe it. Because I was an academic so long, I learned, the, I mastered the craft of quickly structuring my thoughts and then writing a draft of what I think. The thing I had to unlearn was the over-editing. Oh, that's the thing I had to learn. So the thing I had to learn was the over-editing Because in academia, there's such a peer review process where you go through so many variations. When you're writing in the space, when we're writing, you don't know exactly which one of the things you've written is going to resonate with the audience. And so part of me was like just saying, like, structure it, write it, proofread it and publish it. And like, I've got my head in my hands here at the moment, literally, because you're just reminding me of that process, right? Like, How many times have we all sat there and sketched out a few ideas and then sit there and start asking these questions like, well, what if people read it and think interpret it this way? Or what if about this? Or I haven't answered that question. And 
it's so funny that like this parallel about like trying to shoot for perfection mm. gets in the way of shipping, which is a classic pattern in product as well, right? Like people are, oh no, we need to add more features or we need to put more into it before we put it in the market. You know, it's just this classic trap. So many people say that to me as well when they're trying to get started even with writing or even product development. The tendency is to add more to make it perfect before it's shipped rather than what's good enough, put it out in the world and start the conversation. So what were some of the things that helped you get past that? Because as you say, you're conditioned from your PhD. Yeah. You have a panel of people specifically designed that you have to defend your writing from every possible angle, which mm. is tough, I can only imagine. How did you sort of break that on that sort of moment? Yeah. In the social sciences, we have a joke, which is reviewer B. We always call him reviewer B. Because the joke is that reviewer A was somebody that the editor in the journal could find really quickly, so it was okay. But reviewer B was like somebody from some other field that was like a desperate last minute thing. Like, can you just please review this paper? So reviewer B always has feedback that's totally like random, but you have to like respond to it in order for your paper to be published. So just like, oh, that damn reviewer B. So so my whole life for 12 years was dominated by reviewer B. I couldn't survive without reviewer B. And so in the academic world, your ideas evolve in private and then they emerge into the public space pretty much like thoroughly vetted. Right, right. Right. And so in the world we're in now, in the technology startup innovation world, you evolve in public. Yeah. And And that's that's uncomfortable. That's thing you have to learn and unlearn. That's the unlearn and unlearn sort of dance. It's like this idea that I can write something and then the feedback I get from the audience tells me I missed something which allows me to fix that. And the next thing I write, I don't even go back and fix the thing I wrote, right? I fix that in the next thing I write. So if you go through like the 50 articles I've written for Forbes, you'll see the evolution of the thinking. Sometimes topics repeat themselves with a different lens. So I'm kind of evolving out in the open. But that's huge, right? That's (laughs) Well, it's huge because I think for so many people, like it's an act of courage, right? You're vulnerable. You're putting your ideas out there to have the debate in public. But yes, it's funny, as you even mentioned, this idea of reviewer B was probably a secret benefit for you because you're actively looking for people to challenge these ideas to improve them, right? To kick off the debate, to improve the ideas and move forward, you know? And I think there's some real subtleties here that most people probably don't realize, you know, Mm -hmm. that actually by putting our ideas out early and getting feedback, they become more resilient and better. And that requires sort of some humility and vulnerability to just put it out there, but respond quickly Mm -hmm. based on feedback you get. And I think one of the patterns that we are both sort of fans of is this idea of starting small. Like when you put a, a you know, an article is a couple of seven, 800 words probably, and and you start, right? And, And as you say, you've done this 50 times and your evolution of your thinking and is progressing with each article, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot for people to realize there that so many people get stuck just writing the first article because they're trying to make it perfect and they publish nothing versus publishing 50 things and seeing your thinking evolve over time through putting it out there. They're very different systems. As you say, we're talking about this in the context of writing, but mm. you know, I know that pattern, I know you've taken to not only your own work, but to so many other people in the companies and so forth that you're now helping today as you're, you continue to write about in your new book, Pirates in the Navy, again, which is a fantastic, for me, when I was reading it, it's just packed with like great insights about how to do innovation in these larger organizations. And some of the sort of things to be unlearned and about learned to get there. So as you sort of started to then you know, move into this sort of space, what were some of the fun sort of stories that you experiences you had as you started coaching people how to do this in these large organizations? Yeah, so I had the, what do they call it? The zealotry of a convert. Uh, have you ever heard that phrase before? No, no, I'm all, all right. right. I'm ready here. <laughs> yeah. So I was a fanboy. And so... I was a lean startup fanboy. So I was like walking into organizations and I was like zealous, right? I was like, nah, you're all, you don't know what you're doing. Let me show you (laughs) how it should be done. And what's interesting, by the way, actually, now that I think about it, just upon reflection in conversation with you, that's also a pattern of academic debate. Interesting. It's a habit I brought with me from academic debate. In academic debate, 
the debate is really defending positions and showing how smart you are and always trying to be the smartest person in the room because that's how you get credibility, how you become a professor, a reader, and how you get promoted. And so I brought that with me into a space where people are feeling vulnerable because they want to be successful. And now you're telling them that the thing that they're doing that doesn't work because now you've got this new cool thing called Agile and Lean Startup. So I basically mm. rubbed people the wrong way for an early part of my career. Mm. And that's what I had to unlearn to say, no, actually, you have to earn the right to criticize. Like you have to earn the legitimacy. They have to look at you as a partner on the journey. And the only way they can look at you as a partner on the journey is if they get a sense that you understand their struggle and that you've got their best interests at heart. Only then can you then say, okay, let's now flip the switch a little bit, try this and try that. Can you see that it works? Try this and try that. And then you can start to evolve organizations and evolve teams. I think that's a fabulous tip for people, Tendai. You know, I think like a lot of these archetypes people create, as you say, you know, even what's the way to do things? Consultants or smart people come in and tell everybody what to do and leave. But I think you've experienced both sides of that story, right? You obviously know what works now is meeting people where they're at and then building them up. And even in the book, I think you've so many great questions, right, that you ask. Like a lot of this is how do we collaborate with enablers such as finance, legal, HR to actually bring things together rather than see them as a blocker? Get a theory and get what that innovation is important about and how it can be done in your company. I'd love to talk here a little more on this idea of innovation theory, right? Because I think this is a practice that you teach people that I think is also grounded in your science background from social sciences and what you've transported over. So could you explain a little bit about what creating or how to come up with a good sort of theory and then applying that to create innovation in companies? Can you share a little on that? Yeah. So a theory is pattern recognition, right? You see things in the world, you see them recur, and then you're like, oh, okay, X means Y, right? And that's really how you form a theory. So the fundamental theory of innovation is the theory of an entrepreneurship ecosystem. Like, you know, like companies want to think of themselves as startups. It's like, you don't really want to think of yourself as, you don't think of yourself as an ecosystem, almost like the Silicon Valley, like the whole Silicon Valley. And so in that ecosystem, the evolution of successful ideas or the emergence of successful ideas is actually pretty random, right? We don't know what's going to succeed and what's not going to succeed. What we do is we just throw things at the wall. We invest in a whole bunch of stuff. And then we, see what succeeds and what fails. And a lot of the things that, a lot of the ways that entrepreneurs succeed is they succeed at something other than what they thought they were going to be successful. Like they evolved their ideas so much by the time they're successful, they're working on something else, right? But nobody ever says that. Like nobody tells this, all of these patterns. And so that's the theory that you bring into the innovation practice, which is you can't pick winning ideas yourself on day one. Like you can't go, that's the one. It's like telling a musician, go record me a number one hit. They can't do that. They have to record a whole bunch of songs, then try them out on people, try them out live, see which ones get the crowds going. And they go, okay, that's what that one is going to be our first single. It's kind of the way that if you want to get to good ideas, you have to work on a bunch of ideas. But how do you do that then in an organization that says, write me a 30 page business case, tell me how much money I'm going to make in year five and all that, right? So it's the opposite way of thinking in that space you pick the winning idea on day one and you give it as much resource as possible and you push it through according to the roadmap. And so once you get leaders to understand that they can't pick winning ideas on day one, they have to invest in a lot of ideas and then provide the context in which the best ideas bubble up. They go, that makes a lot of sense. Like that's how things work. I know that's how things work. So how do you do that? It's so classic a story of, Common sense is not that common, right? And yet, you know, just listening to you share that, like so much of our conditioning is, you know, even the stories that come out from Silicon Valley, it's all somebody went for a run in the morning, tripped over a stone, and then they started Airbnb, just like that, you know? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly yeah. how it works, right? <laughs> yeah. And even inside companies, right? Like, you know, people build these sort of notions that like they pick the winning idea from the start. And yet all the signs and signals and data, we say it doesn't work like that. And I know you've set these systems up for companies, right? Can you share some examples about how you sort of helped, like they've had this leadership have had this aha moment going, yeah. okay, Tendai, this makes a huge amount of sense. But yet yeah, all our processes or write the business case, get funded for many years, better deliver it or something, otherwise the project's considered unsuccessful. How do you start to help companies sort of unlearn that and 
institute a bit more of a, you know, this optionality approach and mm-hmm. you know, figuring out how to make lots of small bets. So you can learn cheaply, but also then double down when you see signals that you want that you, this is something that has getting response from people. Yeah, I mean, so the first conversation is, let's talk about the conditionality you put on giving people resources to do stuff. And the conditionality that leaders put on people getting resources to do stuff is you have to promise me that whatever resource I give you, you're going to give me back multiples of X by such and such a time. If I'm not convinced that you're going to give me multiples of X by such and such a time, I'm not going to give you the resource. Yeah. So make that explicit because it's sometimes these things are just like implicit in the culture of the company. Nobody really thinks about them and raises them and goes, oh, that's what we're actually doing. That's what these tools we use to make decisions are actually creating in, in terms of conditionalities. And then I say to them, okay, cool. So let's now have a conversation about how much would you be willing to give someone in terms of resource? Like how much would you be willing to give someone if they couldn't promise you that the thing would work? But instead what they promised you was, I can bring you information about whether there's something useful to invest in further there. Like how much would you invest in? And then they go, oh, okay, so that makes sense. If we are going to make a lot of bets, it's better that they're small And it's better that we set conditions that those people come and tell us which things to further invest in. And then we just stop investing in the other stuff. And then we give those people more resources to go figure out more stuff that we can invest in until we find the things that we kind of should double down on. And that's effectively the conversation that you have with them. But it's a lot of like untangling, making explicit the things that are implicit in their habits as an organization. I think that's such a great insight again. Very rarely do people really sort of interrogate why are we doing what we're doing or why does the process work this way and what are some, as you say, the implicit assumptions and policies here. Like surfacing them, I think, is very powerful as you're sharing. And then I love this question as well. You ask, like, I love saying this too. It's like, what would you pay for the information to find out if this is a good idea or a bad idea? What's the smallest amount you'd invest to find out if this is a good idea or a bad idea? Because I think that's such a great framing. Don't give me the million dollars, give me a thousand dollars. But what would you want to see for a thousand dollars to say, this looks like this is an idea worth doubling down on? One of the programs that was running was with this financial institution, right? And financial institutions are pretty stuck at the moment, right? Like they're slowly getting eroded. So they had this sort of idea where they funded basically six teams, four people, and give them a couple of weeks runway to like just test a bunch of ideas that the leadership team had. One of the teams sort of came up with this idea of like pairing financial information with your healthcare information to create better. And then if you could converge both of those worlds, you could offer Mm. some amazing products. Mm. And like the CEO was just like, this is it. This is our amazing idea. And they were literally writing a $5 million check for the team based on a pitch, right? Right. And this is one of those classic moments where the leadership team were trying to change, Mm -hmm. but the natural reaction was to go back to the classic way they would do things. But like the team were sort of sitting there going, right, we just got, but they're going to fund us to do this idea. We don't even know if it works. They were brilliant. What they did is they just said, right, well, we've got this idea. CEO loves it. Why don't we just go out and test it with like 20 or 30 people? Can you imagine how people would feel when the teams go out to you and say, hi, uh, Tendai? Would you be interested in pairing your healthcare information and your financial information with this bank? Right. You're laughing your head off. Exactly. Answer, right. They're like, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> right. I remember them going back, like we were working in these sort of like weekly cycles and they were going back to the CEO and everyone was panicked because right. they were worried of like delivering. This is not going to 95% of people don't want this idea. The tension before sharing that was massive. But again, they did it. And I remember the CEO just sort of looking at them and going, well, how much did you, know, you invest in this? And they were like, oh, it took cost us $5,000 to run these interviews. And the CEO's response was, Tank, will you just save me $4,995,000? So, exactly. You know, all right. And that, it was such a, an unlearning moment for them. I think sometimes as well, people have to experience these things as well yeah. to like really bring it to life. And like, I know you've done this for countless companies, right? Like you're out there helping we did some fantastic portfolio management work, it, helping uh, Pearsons with their life cycles of innovation and all these type of things. Can you share like maybe some of the things that really helped as you sort of brought it into these like 
massive sort of organizations that it feels alien to them. What things sort of jumped out to you as you went through that process? Yeah, so it's interesting, right? Because there's this dance that you do where you have to first you know, coach the team about like, don't love your idea too much, you know, spend time testing it and iterating it. And then they go, okay, cool, because they, you know, like a lot of teams love agile and lean, especially when they're working on technologies. And then you turn around to the leadership and you go, listen, don't ask these people for five-year projections when they come and talk to you. Instead, like ask them questions about evidence and progress and all of this stuff along the product life cycle. And just like yesterday, I was on a call with a colleague who was telling me a story about how they'd done that, right? They trained the leaders and they trained the teams. And then the teams come to do their pitch and they're just pitching for something small. They're like, we've got this idea. We don't know if it's going to work or not. So we just want like 20K to start doing our initial experimentation. And apparently the leadership was so hard on them. They were like, why are you asking for so little money? It means you don't believe in your idea. So why should we invest in it? They didn't do the thing that I told them to not do, but they did it in reverse. So the habit was still there, right? And so you have to kind of, <laughs> again, jump in and go, man, that is an interesting case. And so my colleague was just saying that was the team felt dejected. Like, oh, they didn't absolutely. know what to do now because we coached them and taught them this methodology, but the leadership is still asking them weird questions. So when we first started working at Pearson, we would do the coaching of the teams, we would do the coaching of the leadership and decision-making, and then we would leave. And then we'd come back like a month later and the teams are frustrated that stopped doing what we trained them because they're like, well, you guys just left us and the leaders didn't support what we were doing. So we flipped the methodology and we said, we coached the teams, we coached the leaders, but we sit on the first six to seven board meetings. Yeah. And we're part of the decision-making process and we call out things. Like, that's not the right question to ask right now. That's not the right. So we just sort of have to coach it out of until we feel comfortable that, you know, I've sat quietly in this meeting three or four times and nothing bad has happened. So now I can walk away. I once wrote an article called Training, Lean Startup Training is just not enough. You really have to build organizational habits that allow this to become a repeatable process within the organization. Yeah, no, that resonates massively. And it is like this sort of, it's almost like the teams again up there defending their sort of ideas of their PhD again, right? It's like, what kind of questions are going to be thrown at them? Exactly, and, um, exactly. And there's a lot of advice trap as well that happens. Like I was once working with this large organization that does like credit cards and the team came in, right? And the leaders, they just like ask, they just make questions up because they're leaders. Like they don't realize that if you're a leader, you have to be deliberate about the things you say. You can't just say random things. So they would just say stuff like, so what's your mobile strategy? And then the team would have to go, oh, okay, so there's a mobile strategy thing. So then they'd go, we don't know yet, but we'll work on it and we'll come back with it next week. And then the following week, they'd come back with a mobile strategy. But because the leader was asking it as a random question, they forgot that they asked the team <laughs> to go and work on a mobile strategy. And I'm busy trying to convince these teams that this is a new way of working, et cetera, et cetera. And it's constantly being undermined by this sort of... That's so sort of interesting, interesting again. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny you share it. I actually had Michael Bungai Steiner on the show last week, actually. His book, The oh, Advice right. Trap, just came yeah, out. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Michael's pretty really cool, yeah. It's really cool. But the bit that just struck me there is this notion of like, leaders need to be very deliberate about the questions they ask. Yeah. Because teams will like redirect their whole focus, often based on a passing a question or a, yeah, the leader's sitting there like looking on their phone and someone's like, oh, we, we need to have a mobile strategy, right? I'm going to ask that in our next meeting, right? And exactly. you know, the team that roll out happened to be the team there. And yeah, I think that's a really important point, right? About like helping leaders ask great questions to bring the best out of the team rather than just sort of autonomously just sort of respond to mm -hmm. things. Because just like in the story I was shared, like, right, that CEO was looking, they were under pressure to find business growth. So anything that looked like it had growth, they were just going to react to yes. and actually cause more trouble by sort of putting just a huge amount of investment behind it. So it has to work now. Yeah. I've just put my brand, my identity, my whole behind this idea, which again is one of the patterns you call out in the book as well, is not to tie identity to ideas, but recognize like the first idea might be most likely not the idea to get us there. And Really what we want excellence in is this idea of testing lots of ideas to find out which wins on merit, as you say. And I think that's a really important pattern and for leaders to be aware of. I think that's super important. Yeah, I think it's really, truly important. And a lot of leaders, they're in the habit of being 
You don't become a leader, right, if you're not good at something. So they're in the habit of succeeding and being successful and being recognized. So they kind of carry that with them. And they kind of, there's a little bit of hubris, but a little bit of like playing the role as well, of like wanting to sort of provide guidance. And so when once they make a bet on an idea, it has to succeed. And so what we try and do is we try and like work with teams to disconnect that, to say, just disconnect it. One of the myths of Lean Startup that was kind of, it wasn't even Lean Startup's fault, right? It was just something that kind of emerged out of nowhere is what happens with ideas is that every single idea in the world can pivot itself to success. Yeah, right. That's a classic good. No, no, yeah. Right. Elaborate on that a bit more. That's a great one. So it was like, no matter what it is, if you pivot, you'll find success. (laughs) And that's not really the point, right? Lean Startup is a really great tool for finding things that work and things that don't work. And the majority of times, the things, what you'll find are things that don't work. And only in a few incidents will you find things that work. And so Lean Startup succeeds at a portfolio level where you have a bunch of stuff. It's very difficult for Lean Startup to succeed on an individual idea level, right? Unless that team really navigates even further away from their original idea, so far away that maybe it becomes unrecognizable. And so the biggest question that people have always been asking me is, does Lean Startup in- improve your success rate? Yeah, but the level of improvement is not significant. What Lean Startup does is it allows you to find things that don't work quicker and cheaper so you can stop working on that stuff and double down on the things that work. And once leaders take that mindset to it and teams take that mindset to it, it becomes easier for them to really utilize the tools. You know, I think that's another really important insight for people to sort of take away. You know, it's not like... I have one idea and pivot my way there, but I have many ideas and find out which is the winning idea by working my way through them, you know? And I think that's such a a great way to share with people because you're right. Like so much of the pattern is going to start this startup and I'm just going to pivot my way to success. And yet, you know, it doesn't work like that. And I think that's super helpful for people to sort of Think of it like a portfolio, as you say, portfolio of options and how quickly we can work through them is super powerful. Yeah. And then another quick thing, right, there's just sort of before we can move on is another metaphor that I try and use, and my mind is just bubbling with all these things, is I think like large companies are like rich families. And the question is, how do rich families teach their children to conduct themselves well when there's so much wealth around? Right. And so the best way if you're a rich family to teach your children to be good people is to create artificial scarcity, which is you can't just give them everything they want. You have to create this artificial scarcity. And so what happens with innovation in large organizations is teams have endless resources. So they could just like keep going because they're on the budget already. And when it comes up for renewal next year, they're already a line item. So they just get their 500K again. And so what the way we, we say to leaders is create artificial scarcity, make it like a startup. The reason why startups can't always pivot their way to success sometimes is because they just run out of money. Like there's no more money. So you just have to go home. And so again, you could create the same thing for your startup teams inside large organizations, which is if this is your runway. You earn the next level of investment by the data that you bring to us that tells us that you're going in the right direction. And if you fail to earn the next level of investment, well, you don't get your pocket money. You have to go and cut the lawn next door if you want to get for whatever it is. So it's, I'm just using the metaphor as a way of like creating artificial scarcity within the organization. And that also instills the discipline of having people really focus on what they need to do to become successful. I think that's, again, another great insight, right? And making it small makes it safer to fail. You learn quicker. I think that's a, another really powerful insight for people to take away. Awesome. So looking forward for you then, Tendai. This is your third book. You know, you're going to have another 50 articles, I've no doubt, on Forbes in the next sort of year or two. Well, what are you most sort of excited about now? What are some of the things that are really piquing your curiosity as you look ahead in the work that you're doing? So it's funny. I mean, I have a couple of like innovation projects that I'm kind of trying to wrap up, especially inside Strategizer, where we're trying to create a toolbox for strategy decision making. How do you select the right opportunities to work on? And we're also like working on another tool as well on how you choose the right innovation programs or the right change programs. You know, because again, my latest article actually is kind of the germination of that process, which is little fires everywhere. Is it? innovation lab here. And then before you know it, there's a digital studio, a digital hub, a design sprint, a hackathon thing, et cetera. It's like, what are all these things for exactly? So beyond managing the portfolio of products, now you have to really be deliberate about even the innovation programs that you're running. So we're thinking about ways to sort of frame that as well. So there's still things I'm kind of working through. I'm also like just 
wrapping up, or more, sorry, kind of in the middle of a book called Right Question, Right Time, which is really just about leaders and questions, the conversation we, we were just having. So all of that, once all of that is finished, my mind is kind of percolating back towards psychology now. Oh, because, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. full circle, isn't it? <laughs> circle. Because I'm thinking, actually, underneath all this is a human question. And I know you call it unlearning, right? For me, the bigger concept is being uncomplacent. Please, yeah, no, elaborate. Interesting. So uncomplacency is an interesting concept. And uncomplacency is a problem for successful people. And what I love about the Serena Williams story that you start your book with is that that's a true example of uncomplacency. Oh, she's yes, already she's like amazing. a multimillionaire. Even if like she'd never won another Grand Slam, she would have been like remembered as one of the greatest players ever. Why would David Beckham, being David Beckham, be the first person on the practice field and doesn't leave the practice field until he's tried 50, 100 free kicks? But he's got like a Bentley and 500. Like, what is it about that? Wanting to get better and evolve and unlearn. And what is the psychology of that? What is the psychology of uncomplacency? Interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating. That's Absolutely. a real question for me because disruption happens to the complacent at the organizational level, but actually it's not organizations that get disrupted, right? Because all the decisions are being made by people. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. yeah, no, I think it's a really great topic to dive into, right? One of the things that really inspired me about Serena's story Literally, I was running one of my exec camps in JFK and it didn't go well. I didn't set the, as you say, the conditions up to help the team be successful. I was sitting on this plane, like getting ready to fly back home. And I was just, I was down in the dumps about it all. And then I just turned on this, at the time there was just like this serialization of her sort of uh, life. Mm. I just watched it all the way back on the plane. And it was just profound to understand like this lady who at the time was... 31 when she was knocked out in the first round of Paris, the Grand Slam there. Everyone had written her off. The average age of a tennis player is 27 when they retire. Now she was 31. So people were like, you know, obviously she's had a great career. She's done. And yet she has this resiliency and this curiosity and this drive in many ways to get better. And here she is now like nearly 40 and I know she's going to go out and get into the finals again as right. soon as tennis comes back, you know. And her win ratio is getting better as she gets older. And, right. you know, it's just such a special story. And that really inspired me, as you said, this idea of uncomplacency. It is easy to slip. And it does take energy as well to be focused. You yes. know, and I think, yeah, I'll be certainly interested to see what kind of things you sort of Dig so up you know as you start I, looking in. Yeah, so do you know what I did, right? Which is interesting. I, when I started researching it, it was like, okay, psychology of complacency. So I, I looked it up. And do you know where psychology of complacency is studied the most? No, please. Is in organizations where there's machines that run repetitive processes and somebody has to watch them. And so like, if you've gone to work for like a year and the thing just does the same thing over and over and over, you stop paying attention. Right. Right. And that's when accidents happen. Absolutely. Right. So the organizational behavioral psychologists are really interested in how you have to create some sort of environment where there's a way to bring back attention, like to maintain people's attention, even though they're doing repetitive things. Right. And so the connection between repetition and complacency is like, well, we've we've never seen this before. Startups have never disrupted us. I've been in this business for 50 years. (laughs) I can see where you're going with this. I think this is going to be pretty exciting. Well, I know for sure what I'm going to be doing is continuing to follow your regular posts on Forbes and other areas where you'll be sharing stuff to hear how you bring this idea to life and what this, no doubt, I know there's more books in you. I know we joked before, your your writing velocity is exceptional. So Thank you. thank you for coming to spend some time with us today and sharing, you know, all these books you've written and continue to write and I look forward to seeing the next set of ideas that pop 